All right. Well, I want to welcome everybody to our uh, Water UCI Speaking of Water series, Water Rights and Water Wrongs, Rethinking Equity in California. I'm Dave Feldman. Uh, it's my privilege to be the director of Water UCI and host of our Speaking of Water event. Uh, this is uh, our first live in-person Water UCI colloquium of this academic year. Before I introduce our program and our esteemed panel, uh, I want to just make a couple of announcements. First, we've been very fortunate uh, in the Water Center to have the benefit of a special events committee who has funded our series. Uh, speaking of water is supported by a number of distinguished leaders from throughout the region you've seen on our website. So just want to really give out a, a shout. Thank you to those supporters in the region who make possible uh, this series. Uh, I also uh, want to make note of the fact that some of our Water UCI student members, I think uh, Brian is here currently, one of our, okay, good. Uh, we have a number of student fellows that work for Water UCI and also help in the logistical planning for these events. So just want to really recognize them. We are a university-based center and our ability to involve students as well as faculty and staff in our research is and our education is extremely important to us. And finally, I want to recognize Shannon Roback, the Associate Director of Water UCI, for the wonderful work and unmatched skills in overseeing the uh, logistics organization and planning for this and our other Water UCI Speaking of Water events. Uh, water rights. Legally established water rights have long been a foundation for allocation and adjudication of access to water in California, and they've also been a focus for controversy at various times between various groups over whose needs and uses should prevail. The panel uh, will explore current issues in water rights, including how entitlements are determined, if reforms are needed, and how water rights protections can be made to work for the benefit of everyone in California. Uh, it is now my great pleasure to introduce our panel. We're going to have a series of questions that uh, we'll ask them to answer. They've been uh, pre-given to our panelists. But given the fact that we have a modest size audience today, I think we're going to have an opportunity to certainly solicit questions from you all as well. So be thinking about things that are on your mind because we want to get those involved in our uh, conversation. So to introduce the panelists to my immediate right on this end of the table, Mariah Thompson, who is an attorney with the Community Equity Initiative, the Environmental Justice Program of California Rural Legal Assistance Incorporated. Uh, to her immediate right uh, is Doug Obagi, Senior Attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, next to Doug is Elizabeth Salamone, General Manager for Mendocino County Russian River Flood Control and Water Conservation Improvement District. Uh, and next to Elizabeth is Dave Owen, who's a professor uh, at University of California School of Law in San Francisco. And last but not least, on the far end from me, Eric Ekdahl, who is the Deputy Director of the State Water Board's Division of Water Rights. I'm now going to pitch our first question to the panelists, and as I do, I'd also like to ask each of the panelists to say a little bit about themselves and their background as a way of setting the stage for answering the first question. So we'll start with uh, Mariah. And the first question I've asked the panelists to give some thought about is given California's wide climate variability, questions have arisen uh, in recent years regarding whether our state's system of water rights is well aligned with these changing conditions. What you're thinking about this claim and how might we better align water rights with this changing climate? Mariah? Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Mariah Thompson. Is this an okay volume? For folks? All right, good. Um, so uh, I'm an attorney with California Rural Legal Assistance. I am based in the Fresno office in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, CRLA is a nonprofit statewide law firm that provides free legal services to low-income communities in rural areas. We have about 60 years of experience 
uh, working directly with impacted communities. Um, my program is the environmental justice program at our firm. And so I primarily work on issues of land use, inequitable access to resources, um, housing issues, and a number of other things that my client communities are, um, are experiencing inequities around kind of every day of their lives. In terms of our water work, um, we work directly with the communities that are most impacted by the uh, uh, issues of water contamination, issues of water scarcity. Um, and when we are thinking uh, kind of moving forward and, and including having this conversation today, um, you know, it's important to think about how those folks are often left out of the conversations about uh, how we should allocate water rights. Um, you know, I think we often think of the big fight as between, you know, do we protect nature and the environment versus farming and industry? But we forget that the people that are, you know, picking the food in that industry are living adjacent to those fields and reliant on things like wells that are going dry because of the use of agriculture and kind of mismanagement of water rights. So that's the perspective that I'm hoping to bring to the conversation today. Um, and in, in terms of the question about whether or not the current system of water rights aligns well with you know, climate change and the changing hydrology in California, I think from you know, the perspective that we represent, the current system of water rights just has always disadvantaged our clients. Um, and unless there are serious, you know, kind of restructuring of uh, how those systems are allocated moving forward, we'll continue to likely disadvantage our clients. Most of my clients uh, live in, like I said, rural areas where out, they're outside the city. They don't have reliable access to the water that, you know, we who live in cities can just turn on the tap and we know it's going to be there. And we don't really think about whether in five years, 10 years, two years, if we turn on our tap, if anything is going to come out of it. And so the groundwater rights that they receive by purchasing their property in the rural areas are the only rights that they have. Um, in terms of you know having access to water, and so you know if that water table below their homes decreases, um, it doesn't really matter if they have those water rights if they can't reach the water. You know it costs tens of thousands of dollars to uh, dig a well deeper. Most residential homes in the rural areas of California have well depths of less than 200 feet. Agricultural wells, you know, a thousand feet at a minimum. So that's what the competition is. And so as the straws sort of suck the aquifers dry, the first people that are going to lose water from that are our clients. And other than like those groundwater rights that I mentioned, they don't really have a right other than that to actually be able to acquire the water. They just have a right to sort of try. Um, which of course leads to these inequities. So, um, you know, Obviously, it doesn't currently work, and so hopefully in the future, we'll find a way to make it work better. Thank you. It's a real privilege to be here today. My name is Doug Obiji. I'm a senior attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council, where I've been privileged to work for 15 years. And my work primarily uh, focuses on trying to protect enough water to remain in our rivers and streams to protect fisheries and the thousands of jobs, Native American tribes, and communities that depend on healthy rivers. But I've also worked with a number of groups to try to implement the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act to protect low-income communities because they really are left behind um, all too often, and to try to reform our water rights system. I'm a firm believer, to begin with, that our water rights system is much more flexible than we ever give it credit for. People have a perception of water rights as a guarantee of something. And in fact, it's never been as rigid as people. some people want it to be. Um, to my mind, the challenge here today is less about changing the law than it is the political will to use the tools that we have already. So it's important to step back and think about when our water rights system was created, the white settlers who came to California completely made up the system that we now have. It's a system called the appropriative rights system that means effectively first in time, first in right. So if your great-great-grandfather came here to California, killed the Native American tribes, and then dug a ditch and started diverting water, they got to have that water right. Obviously, at the time, when many of these water rights were being given out, people of color, women, Native American tribes, and the environment were not, able, were not legally able to hold water rights. 
And that's why we have a water rights system that is, frankly, fairly, fairly inequitable and based on the state's racist history. And so at the same time, however, we have a climate in California that's the most variable in the nation. We have huge swings in precipitation, as we see just over the last two years, to go from one of the driest years in California's recorded history to one of the wettest years in California's history. And so no one has a guaranteed right to any finite amount of water. What we have under this appropriative rights system is a place in line. And the real inequity, to my mind in some ways, is that those who are first in line get every drop of water under their water right before the next person in line gets a single drop. At the same time, California law has always had a lot of really important checks and balances on the exercise of a water right. The first of these is the ancient public trust doctrine, which draws back on Roman law, and that the, US, the California Supreme Court held in the Mono Lake case requires state agencies and the courts to always be willing to reconsider a water right. No water right is guaranteed in perpetuity. And the second is the state's constitutional provision that was added in 1928, our section 10, article two, the reasonable use doctrine that says that all water rights, even if you have a water right, you have to use that water reasonably and beneficially, not just for a beneficial use, use but also reasonably. And what is reasonable, importantly, changes as we look at the climate changing, as we look at society's preferences in terms of actually protecting the environment, which, you know, when we first were a state, dams were illegal. We had this abundance of water and no one really ever thought that we would lose our salmon runs. We had salmon canneries in Fresno. We had salmon canneries throughout the state. We had Native American tribes who depended on them. And now we have a closed salmon fishery largely because of mismanagement of water. So to my mind, we have a water rights system that is flexible enough to adapt to climate change, but it does involve winners and losers. And obviously those who are privileged to hold the most senior water rights are those who are least interested in giving up that privilege. Hi, everybody. I'm Beth. I manage a small water district in Mendocino County, which is a couple of hours north of San Francisco. Um, I'm here today speaking as myself with my background, but not for my district, um, which leans into this question quite a bit, which I'll explain in a moment. The region in Mendocino County along the Russian River watershed is rural, um, agricultural, mostly wine grapes, some fruit trees. Um, very low population, not a lot of funding to undertake projects um, or address the current water supply situation or what we predict will be happening with climate change. Um, we, out of desperation, um, our region has created a few innovative approaches, which I'll talk a little bit about. But regarding the question about um, well aligned to changing conditions, uh, meaning climate change, my first reaction to that question was, what is well aligned to climate change? Um, I think we are all across every sector uh, going to be impacted by climate, we are impacted by climate change right now. And I think we're past the point of trying to convince anyone it's real, uh, whether whiplash is, is, we are feeling it. And so I wanna think about this holistically. This is, this is, I believe, how we're going to have to approach this. It isn't going to be one watershed, one, one activity, one project. In the Russian River watershed, for example, there's no one project that's going to solve all of our water reliability issues. We're going to have to implement a lot of smaller actions and maybe one or two larger actions, which we cannot financially fund. We're going to need, we're going to need support from the state and the, and the feds to do that. Regarding water rights, what I have found in my work where water rights really impede the work we need to do would be the lack of flexibility. So I think we need to talk later, by the way. Uh, I mean, everybody, I'm so excited with all these great people up here to talk to them later. Um, flexibility and adaptation, and most importantly, efficiency. Um, it, we just, it takes so long. Uh, we, have a, we have a water rights license, which is supposed to be a little more solid than the permit. And it doesn't serve our community well. We need to make changes, but we have to reopen our license, which puts it at risk for additional changes. And people are afraid of change. And it's costly, and it takes a long time. And we can't begin implementing those changes that we need to immediately um, upon filing for that change petition on our license. So, so it's, 
we need to move faster. And I know when we're talking about bureaucracy, that's the last thing that we would think. But I believe that the level of desperation is, is it's possible to move faster. And I'm not gonna stop trying. I, I keep trying to find sh ways to move things along. One of the other issues is the nature-based solutions. We don't have water rights for the environment. We have some sort of, you know, minimum in-stream flows that are linked, you know, connected to dams and permits and operations. And I won't get into the jargon, but it's sort of a by default a water right for the environment, but it really isn't. And what? We, how do we do that? There, there's some really smart people, way smarter than me, that are thinking about this, and I'm reading their articles, and I, I think we need to consider how we can do this. But we need to be creative and nimble, and we also, in that, need to address the fear. And when we talk about these changes, there's a great deal of fear. The water right holders right now are often afraid of changes to water rights law, especially if they're a senior water right holder, because they don't want anything taken away from them. And I will re remind you of <laughs> the previous speaker talking about how those water rights were obtained, um, which is one of the reasons that I'm here speaking for myself today, because it, there's a lot of fear and concern that what this modernization or reform will look like. But I think that there are administrative processes that can be done that will improve the current system, hopefully bring equity into it more and more. And an example would be the forecast informed reservoir operations. It's a way that we can change how we're managing a great infrastructure project through just simply managing it, using technology to forecast storms and being able to hold more water in a reservoir rather than just release it based on archaic operational manuals. So if you want to learn more about that, it's FIRO, F-I-R-O, Forecast Informed Reservoir Operations. And the reservoir where my district stores water was the pilot project for that, Lake Mendocino. Um, but now it is, it's spreading, and it's a phenomenal example of bringing folks together from various sectors, working together as a team, and figuring out new ways of managing what we already have. And that was with the Army Corps of Engineers. So if they can be flexible, I think that we could do that with water rights. There are a couple of other things that are happening, like the Upward program, which maybe Eric will talk about later, but that's um, about data collection and making it accessible, modernizing how we're holding the data on water use so that we can actually use that um, and including that with telemetry, which hopefully my district or region will have a pilot project on telemetry to make that real-time data available. So I think the ultimate answer here is, you know, are water rights aligned with the changing hydrology? Uh, no. I think there is room to be creative and change, but we have to do this quickly. And with that, so we have to address the fear that's underlying that. Thank you. Um, so my name is Dave. Uh, I teach uh, environmental law, water law, other related courses at UC Law, which until recently was UC Hastings uh, in San Francisco and, and formerly was a practicing water lawyer. Um, I agree with, with what we've heard before, so I'm going to focus in a little bit more narrowly, um, although let me start by giving some context. I think if to have a, a water rights system that is able to adjust to changing conditions and, and to address changing conditions you know, you'd either need to have the allocation of rights and be fair and just and and in many ways suited for the coming conditions. And as you've heard, that's not the situation that you'd have. Or you would need to have internal mechanisms within the system for adjustment. Um, and as Doug said, we have some of those. We have a bunch of doctrines on the books in California that in theory give regulators some ability to make adjustments to deal with some of the more problematic aspects of our, our existing water system. And then of course, within a property rights system, we also have the ability to exchange. Uh, and so rights in theory can be traded. Um, and that can be another way of reallocating rights in a way that adapts to changing conditions. So that part, in theory, both of those things are quite possible with California water rights. The big problem that I see is more one of information uh, in that we 
often do not have very good information about the scope of rights. We don't have very good information about the scope of water use under those rights. We don't have good information about what exactly the environmental flow obligations you know, against which those rights should be measured should be. Um, and for some classes of rights, some of the oldest rights, uh, you know, really very little information about the scope of the right at all. And, and I'm just talking about surface water rights for the moment, which are the relatively better defined set of rights in California. We also have even larger issues with groundwater use and groundwater rights. And so that I think really hamstrings both of the likely adjustment mechanisms we would use to try to adapt the system to changing conditions. Makes it very hard for the regulator to operate, but it also makes it hard for decentralized solutions that involve exchanges or creative collaborations among groups of water users to work as well. Because if you don't have a clear baseline understanding of the uses and the rights, that makes it difficult to proceed forward. Great, right, thank you. I'm Eric, I'm the Deputy Director for the Division of Water Rights at the State Water Resources Control Board. I manage the division that's ostensibly responsible for administering and overseeing the state's water rights system. But in saying that, and before I answer the, the question that was asked, I want to take a step back and even just talk about what, what kind of water rights exist. Because we've thrown about, out a bunch of terms and this may be old news for some of you in the audience, it may not be. Uh, there's lots of different types of water rights in California. I'm going to greatly paraphrase. I'm not an attorney. I'm a geologist. So bear with me if I mangle some of the legal descriptions. But we, we do have appropriative rights, first in time, first in right. We also have something called riparian rights, which is really based on if you are adjacent to a water body, you get to use a correlative share of the natural free flow of that water. You have federally reserved rights. Those could be something like an army or navy base. It could also be tribal rights. Uh, there's something called Pueblo rights. There's only two of them verified in the entire state, but they go back to the 1700s. Uh, and then there's groundwater rights, which you know maybe aren't legally defined, but we'll kind of treat them as their own kind of separate group here. The state water board only regulates, and the state as a whole, only regulates a small subset of those whole big lists that I just listed out. We only have direct regulatory oversight over post-1914 appropriative rights. So all those other kinds, we actually don't have a lot of oversight over. We get some very basic information. Uh, here's my claim of right. They call them claims because they've actually never been verified if they're pre-1914 or a riparian for the most part. Uh, and they just say, this is how much I've claimed. We don't have the ability to ask them to prove it. We don't have the ability to ask them to verify it. We can't even ask. And we can't even ask them to go back and clean up what is clearly erroneous submittals in their initial claim. Uh, there are nuances to that, right? In certain regulatory constructs and settings in the recent drought, for example, some emergency proclamations were passed, drought proclamations. We were able to adopt emergency regulations to kind of go in and, and actually curtail some of those diversions during uh, you know, critical drought periods. But for the most part, without certain constructs in place, we actually can't even tell diverters to stop diverting. Uh, only in two years out of the last 150 have we actually ordered vast swaths of the state to stop diverting during critical drought. Uh, other than that, without, again, emergency regulations in place, all you can do is really send strongly worded letters. Uh, and I, I'm not exaggerating. We can send a strongly worded letter. Uh, we don't regulate groundwater at all. There are scenarios with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act where there are pathways to having the state kind of more directly step in. And there have been lots of efforts locally, uh, local adjudications to address groundwater regulation through the courts, but the board itself and the state itself doesn't have regulatory oversight over where you drill a well, how much water you pump out in most circumstances. The regulated versus non-regulated pool, there's about 40,000 plus water rights or claims of right in California. Uh, we can regulate about 55% of those, which accounts for about 70% of the volume use 
statewide. So about 30% is completely unregulated and we don't have the authority to even ask questions about it. So that sets a very difficult starting point to this question of, you know, is the system well aligned? No, it's, it's not. It's very slow to respond. Uh, we have immense questions about quantity accounting. I, I, I've made this comparison before. Talking about water rights accounting is the least sexy thing you can talk about in water. And yet it's the most important thing. And we have as, as a state not done it. We haven't invested in just basic understanding of who's diverting what, when, and where. And I'll try and wrap this up relatively quickly. I know there's other questions and we'll probably come back to this, but if you look at like when California actually started requiring reporting, uh, it was really 2009 when people actually had to start reporting their water diversions. Even then, they only had to report it once every three years, and it was on a monthly time step. So it also was on paper. And so in 2009, we got a bunch of statements. They're in a bunch of boxes in the Cal EPA records room in Sacramento. That's the only way you can get that information, is if you make an appointment to go and go and find something in one of these boxes, it's not digital, it's not accessible by the public or really anyone else. And this is the Upward Project Beth referenced earlier. Funding finally came through in 2021 to actually digitize this and bring it into the, onto an online form. Uh, it's difficult to uh, think of how to adapt and how to bring that data together if we don't start getting data more real time. Understanding that we get data, you know, 2009, we started getting paper, 2012, finally said it had to be electronic. It wasn't until 2015 that we said you actually had to meter and measurement that required statutory change. 2016, the regulations were in place. 2018, before that was fully grandfathered into all of the diverters. 2019, before that data came in. Our compliance rate right now, we figure is three to 4%. So, challenges. It uh, doesn't mean that it's not possible, though. And in one sense, the, the best, uh, brightest spot in all of this is that things are so bad that we have the opportunity to make a lot of progress. And so there's immense progress that can be made and will be made, I think, in the future. But we're not flexible right now. So I'll stop there. And I'll just go. Thank you. Thank you to all of the panelists. I want to go now to a second question. And I think then we'll open it up to questions that the audience will have. Uh, the second question, and Dave, I'm going to start with you to answer this question, if we could, to kick it off. Uh, a recurring issue in water rights in California and the West, more generally, is the reserved rights of tribal nations. What are some of the most serious and unresolved water rights concerns of these nations? Uh, and um, are earnest actions being taken to address these concerns? Why or why not? Dave? And, and so I volunteered to start on this question, um, not so much to fully answer that, I think I'm gonna leave that to the fellow panelists, but just for the sake of those of you who are, are not lawyers uh, or are not water lawyers, just to give you a little bit of background on how tribal water rights work. Um, so in California and elsewhere in the West, tribes typically have water rights um, either because of treaties and so, for example, in the Pacific Northwest, extending down into Northwestern California, there are a number of tribes whose treaties, either with the states or with the federal government or both, specify that the tribes held fishing rights. And a series of court decisions has said that with the right to fish comes the right to have water in the river so there can be fish. So that's, that's one type of right that tribes hold. The other type of right is associated with the reservation of federal land. So Eric alluded to this briefly before. When the United States government reserves land for a specific purpose, and that's a term of art that means it sets aside land that it already owns for a specific purpose, the legal doctrine is that it also reserves sufficient water to fulfill that purpose. And this could be for any sort of federal reservation, military reservation, for example. Um, but often it arises with reservations for tribes because those reservations were land that was already claimed by the federal government uh, 
and was set aside by the federal government. And so the legal doctrine says that when that happens, sufficient water is reserved by the federal government to fulfill the purposes of the reservation. And interestingly, because the because basically the idea at the time most reservations was created was to take tribes that had been nomadic, in some cases not always in California, but in many places had been nomadic and turn them into farmers, the purpose of the reservation was then to reserve enough water so that the tribes could farm. And that can potentially be a lot of water. And then these rights as a practical matter are treated like appropriative rights, but with a very senior date of appropriation because the tribes in theory held those rights from time immemorial. So that means that tribes in the West often have in theory potentially very powerful, very old, but also ill-defined rights. And then a last related challenge, and I'll turn it over, is that in order to take advantage of a right, you need to not only have the right, but you also need to have the money to build infrastructure to actually exploit the water. And in many cases, tribes in the West have had very powerful rights on paper, even if those rights had never been crisply defined in a court proceeding, but they had no money, and the federal government was not providing money to them to take advantage of the rights. Uh, and so they were in this curious position of you know, sort of being theoretically water rich and practically water poor. So that's, a, that's just a general background, and I'll let my fellow panelists talk some about the, the specifics in California. Great, thank you. Eric, why don't we go to you, and then we'll come back to this end of the table. Great. Uh, it's, uh, that was a fantastic kind of overview, and the uh, scenario that I think the state board finds itself in is that our role here is surprisingly, like I was describing earlier, limited. The, the biggest challenges are, I think, the, the quantification, understanding where those rights exist, uh, maybe hasn't been done, but is maybe a little bit more straightforward, but understanding what that volume of water is, uh, is very challenging and very expensive. And we think about how that process would occur. Typically it occurs through a federally driven kind of adjudication or settlement type process, at least in theory. And in doing so, you have to understand who else is using water in the system, how much water they're using, and then how the tribe's rights would fit within that kind of broader construct. Uh, you also have to then understand public trust components and the science that would go into establishing fisheries needs or other types of environmental or other public trust considerations. And so when we look at the costs associated with doing that for just a simple small watershed, uh, again, it's more theoretical because we haven't done it recently at least, that I'm aware of. There's maybe one or two in the works, and there was one that was done, uh, you know, I said we haven't done, the state board hasn't done it. There's one, uh, Kawea, in the uh, Temecula watershed that I think is just wrapping up after 71 years of litigation. Uh, they're very expensive, 10, 20, 50 million dollars minimum. Potentially, if we talk about a larger watershed when we've played out this thought exercise, 500 million to a billion dollars. Uh, so what role does the board have then? Well, we implement it. If we do have a quantified right, it goes, as Dave said, into this very senior type priority position. But without that in place, we still are trying to do a lot of work. Uh, there are other considerations, in-stream flows, establishing in-stream flows. When we take a enforcement action, prioritizing enforcement actions to recognize tribal uses, tribal needs, trying to do a much better job, and this is something that we've struggled with, frankly, in engaging tribes and uh, engaging in government-to-government -government consultation with them, recognizing their needs and interests as part of our decision-making process. And it's an ongoing effort uh, that we do need to do better at, but it is an active part of kind of our, our path forward and how we look at every water right decision that we undertake. I'll stop there. Thank you. Mariah? Thank you. Um, so I have not worked with Native American tribes, but I think that one thing I wanted to point out is that it is kind of 
inescapable uh, the the viewpoint of how the history of colonization um, that has impacted uh, the rights of you know tribal folks to engage in you know what I think many would argue are their human rights to engage in their um, uh, both cultural practices as well as their human right to water and food and all of those things you know it's similar but not the same populations that are bearing the brunt of um, other kinds of sort of colonization and chopping up of land and resources, um, such as the communities that we work with. I work with indigenous communities that are not Native American communities, but are um, indigenous communities from you know Mexico and Central America that are farm workers. Um, and like I mentioned before, the folks that are getting left out and are you know having their interests overshadowed are brown and indigenous um, communities of color. Right, They are folks that have historically not had access to the systems that create and enforce these rights. You know, um, Native American tribes were forced off of their land through genocide, and many were forced to enter into inequitable treaties. And, um, you know, I think that the parallels between who is having to fight for their rights and who doesn't have the money to do so, as was mentioned, you know, there's theoretical rights and then there's the money to actually enforce them. Um, I think it makes... It, it I think it's very clear some of the parallels that can be drawn here, and I think that it's inescapable the inequity that's happening. So I obviously don't speak for any tribes as a white man, but my observation, having worked with some of the tribes and being an ally to many of the Northern American, Northern California tribes, is that the tribal water rights are recognized more in the breach than they are in practice. Mm. And so when you think about the tribes being the most senior water rights holder, the one who holds water since time immemorial because they've been here, um, they should be first in line. And so the Klamath, uh, you know, in the Klamath River, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal, I think three decades ago, confirmed that the Klamath tribe was the most senior water rights holder. And yet that adjudication is now in its 45th or 50th year, and there isn't a final judgment, so that water right is not actually recognized. And so we're watching the Klamath salmon runs that these, that these people hold sacred disappear entirely. Similarly, on the Colorado River, the United States has, before the US Supreme Court, opposed the motion of the Navajo Nation and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal upholding the United States obligation to protect the tribe's water rights to the Colorado River. And instead, the Department of Interior is, is opposing that motion because they don't want to have to have another competing use of water for the Colorado River, even though the Navajo Nation has been there since time immemorial. And as Dave pointed out, it's important not just to think about the reserved water right for the use of water on the reservation, but also to think about the other treaty rights, the rights to hunt and fish in their ordinary and customary places, and those tribal beneficial uses, which typically means keeping fish in good condition, things that California law has mandated for since we were a state, that we, again, recognize more in the breach than we do in practice. As the vice chairman of the Yurok tribe said really eloquently to the um, state assembly earlier this year, fish are the senior water rights holder. And that is really powerful. And yet, in practice, they generally get they, we have to fight tooth and nail to get water for them because they are not part of this water rights system. They instead become part of a regulatory overlay under the Endangered Species Act, under other provisions of state and federal law that are necessary but not sufficient to actually protect these beneficial uses. And then, of course, there are tribes like the Winnemem Wintu people who are not federally recognized. And so they don't have a reservation. They don't have any tribal water rights. The state doesn't recognize any tribal beneficial uses for them. Their land was destroyed when Shasta Dam um, was constructed, and the salmon that they hold sacred are also starting to disappear. And so they don't have water rights. On the other hand, I do have optimism about this, because I think the first step to making change is recognizing that we have a problem. And we've seen Congress uh, appropriate funding for a bunch of uh, Native American water rights settlements in recent years, not in California so much, but to actually recognize the wrongs that have been done and to provide funding to enable tribes to actually exercise their water rights so that they can have safe drinking water, they can have sanitation. 
something that many of the Navajo Nation lack. And then the State Water Board actually did something pretty incredible during the drought, and I really want to give them kudos for this. And it, to my mind, it really embodies both the strengths and weaknesses of our current water rights system. So during the drought on the Scott and Shasta River, the Native American tribes and other attorneys petitioned the Water Board to adopt emergency regulations to protect minimum stream flows for salmon, for endangered coho salmon. And the board, using its emergency authority, did set these sort of emergency rules, like a floor of how much water has to flow just to keep the river flowing and keep the salmon alive. And one of the things that they also did in that order was that even though the rule of a priority would say, first in time, first in right, you get all your water first, they actually created an exception using the reasonable use doctrine, saying that if you need water for human health and safety, if you really need this water to drink, to bathe, you are exempt from that curtailment order. So even if you're one of the junior water rights holder, you still get that water to keep human health and safety and to recognize the human rights of water. Unfortunately, and telling the other side of the story, the irrigation district up there decided that they would blatantly violate the curtailment order. And so they were quoted in the press saying, eh, it's only gonna cost us 50 bucks per farmer to violate this so we can dry up the river, who cares? And because the, the existing enforcement mechanisms for the board are so inadequate, in part because, frankly, there are those who would rather have a system that doesn't have regulation, that doesn't have a, a police officer on the beat, the board was unable to take immediate action to stop this. And so we now are seeing efforts in the legislature to reform this system, to strengthen and modernize our enforcement system. What we have right now is the equivalent of as I like to tell folks who are not in the water world, it's as though you see a car speeding down the road and instead of a police officer pulling them over and giving them a ticket, they get a sternly worded letter that if in 20 days, if they don't stop, they're gonna get punished. None of us wants to live in a community where nobody, where everyone blatantly violates the law. But that is often, all too often, the situation we find ourselves in. So I think we have both opportunities for progress and a lot of work to do. It's really fun following you, I have to say. <laughs> Everybody's all riled up. Um, so I'm gonna talk about tribal nations a little bit differently. There's a couple of perspectives or a couple of focuses. One is on their actual water right and the issues there, and then their cultural um, relationship with water. So the, in, in my region, we have many small, poor, uh, tribal nations or tribal communities that are not seen as um, nations. So we locally, we try to recognize them all equally um, and in, in, engage with them. But they are small. They're, they're poor. They're scared. Um, and they're surviving, and sometimes barely. And so I'm going to give you two examples. Lake Mendocino, as I mentioned, is the reservoir where my district stores water along with another um, entity. That is in Coyote Valley. So the tribe that was displaced from those lands in order to build that reservoir have no rights to that water at all. Um, they were moved, and they have no rights to that water. I mean, that, that's embarrassing for me as a manager of the, the rights that were issued to my county from that project. Um, another story is an, another local tribe that has been displaced twice from their lands, and both of those former lands have very successful vineyards on them. But they are up on a hill with very small amount of water. Um, they can't farm that land. They have a tiny little groundwater well that they can't improve because they can't afford it, or there's regulations, I'm not really sure. They, at some point there was a lawsuit in which the amount of water that fell from the sky and landed on the, the land that they, they have now been issued that amount of water is their right, and it is taken from the, the river and pumped to them at a cost to them by a public entity. So that public entity takes out the water and charges them to move it to their lands. And that public entity treats them as though they are just any other customer. So when we had curtailments or we had um, drought conditions where everyone was cutting back, they sent the form letter to the tribe saying, you must cut back this much. If you don't, your water will be turned off. 
that that was horrific. And when in talking to some of the staff there at that tribe, they're afraid to come forward and discuss any of these issues because they're so afraid that the, the little rights they have may be threatened or taken away. And why would they trust us? Why would they trust anyone? Um, and so as, as Eric mentioned, engagement, I personally am I'm making personal relationships with some of the representatives of our local tribes in order to build those bridges because engagement is difficult. They don't have funding to pay staff to for their time to attend our meetings. So now when we're writing grants, we're including funding to compensate for their the resources of their time and energy and expertise. So we have to really get creative about that. Um, there's, as I said, there's a great amount of fear. And the other thing that a colleague mentioned to me was, when we invite them to our tables, these aren't their tables. This isn't how they do business. This isn't how they work. So we're inviting them into our world. Where are we making an effort to be invited and keep open minds into the, tr the tribal culture um, and how business is done very, very differently? So these are all based on personal relationships. And I, I'll come back to this again and again, that anything we're trying to do, it's, it's got to be in relationship with, uh, with the resources, with each other, and with ourselves. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, too. So that brings me to the second part of tribes in general is the cultural relationship. So they are in relationship with the environment, with the world, with with creator, with water. So they're not trying to control it. They're listening to it. They're watching it. They have history and knowledge that we have no understanding of, nor have we really tried. Um, a few of us in my region are trying to put together a project where we could just simply interview those tribal members who are willing to talk to us about the historic relationships and knowledge they have on water in our region, hoping that we can learn something, that we could take this knowledge and, and move forward with it with nature-based solutions, looking at what water wants, what it wants to do, what it did in the past, how we've messed around with it, and how maybe we can, in relationship between the gray infrastructure that we've put in to just control the water the way we want to, and, and build green infrastructure, um, you know, flood, re restoring floodplains and, and creeks and things like that. How about just recognizing the names of the waterways? Like the Russian River kind of tells it all, right? Like that is, and when I've asked, you know, what is the name of this river in, um, in various tribes? They all have different names for it. So I think we just need to find a better name, but we need to learn the history and, and in, encourage encourage our way of thinking to be more broad-minded, opening up to not being in control of everything, but being in relationship with it. And really, that for us, that means stewardship, right? That's a word that we can listen and understand. And doing this holistically across not just water, but all of the things that intersect with water. I think I'll leave it there. All right. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. We're going to turn now to questions. Before I do, I just want to make one quick announcement. Uh, following this panel, immediately following, we're going to have refreshments out in the lobby, so please do stay around and enjoy those, and also give you an opportunity to mix and mingle with our panelists and ask questions and get to know them. Uh, we're going to come around with a microphone. You may notice we are recording this event as we do all of our Water UCI colloquia. So when we call on you, please raise your hand, state your name, affiliation if you'd care, and your question. Yes, come around with a microphone. All right, thank you, thank you. Really enjoyed this talk so far, really great and engaging. Um, my name is Jean. I am um, from the Criminology, Law, and Society de Department, and I'm interested in the intersect of corporate crime, environmental crime, and on water. So the one of the one of the issues that was mentioned on this panel was the issue of like you might have strong water rights, especially if it's with tribes or if it's with like um, indigenous communities, but there isn't a lot of funding 
for these water infrastructure projects. So my question was, what are some of the challenges in receiving funds for water infrastructure, especially at like the state and the government level, the state government level, um, as I'm interested in, in evaluating wh what, what would help to, to give you like more influence or more access to like better, better funding, I guess. Yeah. Go ahead. So I have a, a example of this being a problem. Um, so like I mentioned, most of my client communities are on groundwater. I represent a, uh, a group of uh, folks, low-income farm worker folks, in an unincorporated area in Fresno County that are immediately adjacent to a community water system that was built in their community because of nitrate contamination in the 90s except for they left some people out all around the edges of it because whoever decided where the borders were probably never actually went there. And so I have clients that live all the way around this, uh, this clean water source. Um, but my clients all have high levels of nitrate contamination, uranium, DBCP, cannot drink their water, do not drink their water and are spending what little money they have, a lot of it is buying water. Okay, so the state created a program with funding for consolidation of situa for situations just like this, to connect contaminated uh, water systems to existing water systems that are nearby um, in order to address these kind of inequities and problems. The thing that we're running into is politics. Um, we have a project that we have been told is a you know model project, and we have a county and a city that are immediately adjacent. The, the community is 0.3 miles from um, from the city boundary, and the city and the county are fighting so much over who would be responsible for dealing with the project that neither of them want to put in any time to uh, to receive the money. They won't even they don't even want to put in time to do an application for the money. Um, we even have technical assistance providers that will write the entire application, do all the engineering reports do everything and they still won't do it because neither of them want to be responsible for managing it after the project's done. And the state actually has teeth to force consolidation, but they have so many people that want the money and are going to volunteer for the money that why on earth would they spend those resources trying to force it on uh, jurisdictions that don't want it? And so politics can get in the way a lot in addition to all the many other obstacles for getting funding. And that's one of the things that is the hardest to move. Um, because it'll really just depend on the mindset of the people in power. And, and I, I totally agree that politics, and that is a great example of how the politics are all too often uh, aligned against poor people. I'd add three other big challenges. One is just the technical assistance. You know, having to fill out a complicated grant form, Native American tribes, many communities just don't have the resources to hire someone to fill this out, to hire the engineers, to hire the chemists, to hire the hydrologists, to do all the work that the agencies want to make sure this project's gonna work. The second is that many grants and loans, and, and to be fair, the state is really trying to solve that problem by providing technical assistance to low-income communities and tribes, and so we're trying to address that, but it is a challenge. The second is that many grants and loans require a matching requirement. And so for smaller communities, that just may be out of reach. You may not have the money to be able to put up 25%, 50% of this project and get the other half from the feds. Um, and again, the state is trying to solve that in some ways. Uh, the third is really insidious. And the example from Pajaro Valley, I think, is really uh, highlights it. And that's that in many of these poor communities, a project is not cost effective because the community is for, is poor. So in the Pajaro Valley, which flooded earlier this year, there had been plans to build levy improvements to protect this farm worker community, but because the land was not valuable enough, because poor people live there, it was not cost effective. And thus the project has languished for years, even though everything was ready to go, but there wasn't the funding to say, this is actually cost effective and we can move forward. And so now we have a whole bunch of families that have been flooded out of their homes and you know, causing real devastation. to make sure that I get everyone. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, good afternoon. Uh, wonderful panel. I'm learning quite a bit. My name is Lisa Haney. I'm from Irvine Ranch Water District. Um, I think I am surprised about what I'm hearing today about water rights and, and specifically about lack of regulation with groundwater. I am curious what the future might look like for stormwater water rights and um, if there's a good news story somewhere in here <laughs> for the future. Uh, I'll jump in and start. And uh, I, I think there actually is a tremendous amount of good news related to stormwater. And uh, the, maybe the best news is that in most stormwater, you don't need a water right. Uh, so long as you're kind of capturing it before it gets into a natural water course, if it's just runoff from a street and it goes into a retention basin, you don't need a water right. Uh, there's ambiguity in some certain cases, but it opens up a tremendous amount of opportunity. And we've seen that across Southern California in particular, the development of called low impact development or bioswales, permeable pavement, all these things that are attempts to kind of capture stormwater before it just rolls off into the ocean or into a big concrete ditch. Uh, that is good news. There's a lot of funding, or there was a lot of funding associated with it. Uh, a number of groundwater capture grants administered by the state board, amongst others, over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, and there's more opportunities for it, I think, in the future. This year, in particular, it's been interesting because stormwater gets conflated with flood water, and when do you draw the line between the two? And generally, if it's in a naturally occurring river, then we maybe call it more flood water in some circumstances. And if you are just attempting to manage that flood control, you don't need a water right for that either. Now, if you're attempting to intentionally recharge it with plants to then capture it, store it, and then sell it to somebody later on or use it later on, then you do need a water right. But there are processes to move more quickly. We've come up with a number of expedited permitting processes. So we have a 180 day temporary permit to maximize flood capture, uh, a tremendous amount of progress this year on that topic, working with our other agencies as well. I'll, I'll just chime in as well to say, I think a broad theme has been critiques of the water rights system and you know, lack of information, poor allocation, you know, difficulty with innovation. There are a lot of places with California, within California where you can go and find a very different story. Um, and for a combination of reasons. Um, sometimes it's been because local governments a long time ago recognized they couldn't afford not to address the issue, um, particularly in Southern California, a lot of the water rights are basically consolidated. You have you know, a relatively small number of urban districts that hold those. Um, and so particularly in the area where we now sit, there's been a lot of very creative adaptation strategies that you know, I think my part of the state should learn from. So, so there are a lot of positive stories as well to tell. It's a good reminder too. I, I sometimes am accused of being overly pessimistic. And it, you know, sometimes you get in the questions, you start talking about what are the issues and the problems with, and then you're naturally lended towards talking about the issues and problems. There is a tremendous amount of good stuff that's happening too. Uh, but it is challenging with droughts and some of the good stuff. Beth and I had the opportunity to work together on kind of you know, addressing uh, curtailments through alternative regulatory mechanisms. And there is flexibility in other avenues. And maybe I'll let Beth jump in too. Well, I was usually I'm the optimistic one, but I'm going to add a little pessimism to this um, <laughs> just to keep it lively. Um, <laughs> I would say when it comes to storm and flood water use, um, in a smaller region under resourced region, um, just the infrastructure to get that water where we need it to be. So we're a flood control district. You'd think we could get the water out of the main stem of the river that's gonna flood downstream and we could just put it on the ground. We're not gonna use it again. We're just gonna get it out of the, the way. Um, but the only way that I could have that happen was if farmers were willing to pump it. Well, farmers literally have a straw that goes in the river with a fish screen at the end. They, they can't put their infrastructure in the river to get that water out. Or if they do have an underflow well, they have a well near the river that's pumping you know, water that's flowing underground, they, it costs money. Who's gonna pay them to pump that water? Who's gonna pay for the wear and tear on the infrastructure? So when we're talking about groundwater recharge or storm, you know, storm water use of any way, the farmers that contract for water um, under our license, they don't wanna hear about it. They, they see it as expensive. 
impractical, dangerous. It's, you know, not to mention that it's just something new and, and you know, very scary. Um, so I was talking to Eric about this earlier. Um, one of our customers came up with a term called simulating rain. And um, that they can digest. They, they understand if it's not raining, uh, but there happens to be natural flow in the system from a previous storm, they can pump that and uh, they can make it pretend rain. Um, so, <laughs> so there's, a, again, it's the fear. Um, and it, it also links to the, to the previous question about funding. You know, this if you don't know that there's funding there or how to get it, then you're not going to get it. So I've had this conversation with some of the state um, the state folks who are issuing these grant applications or, you know, the request for grant applications, we, we don't have the resources to put together a grant application. And usually it's like, they're due tomorrow. And so where do we start? And, and so I, I said, well, we can't possibly apply for this one. We don't have the time. What's the next one coming down the line so I can start working on it now? Well, they don't really know. So we can guess, we can make a big swing. Um, and then the other thing that's happening is they're, they're large amounts of money. So we only needed like a million dollars and the smallest amount was $5 million. So the solution is, oh, you should, you should bundle several different projects together. And I'm like, oh yeah, have you been here? Like trying to work with all of these different entities and bundle projects and then who's going to apply for it and who's going to disseminate the, the money and collect, you know, it's, it's a nightmare. And then along the lines of the SAFER program, I believe is what you were talking about earlier, um, where it's looking at consolidation and things like that. The I was thinking the same thing, the political power and manipulation. So those entities that in theory have more power uh, and control in these situations could use that and use this program that the state has created, which is great, to, to further their their position and platform. Um, and those smaller entities are under-resourced, they don't understand, they're not seeing the big picture. And so, you know, they get to a certain point and they can't turn back. And it, again, it's 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 taking, you know, it's oppression, it's taking advantage of those who, who are just surviving, barely. Sorry about the pessimism. All right, don't worry, wonderful. I, I can be the most oh, pessimistic you're, you're, and cynical person on the oh, table. You're gonna, you're gonna notch it up. Problem. Okay, great, here we go. Um, <laughs> go ahead, Doug. You know, I think we're making a lot of progress on groundwater recharge, but one of the issues around water rights and groundwater recharge, whether it's from stormwater or floodwaters, is when we look at the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, and when we think of groundwater more generally, it's considered a shared right that everyone who's an overlying landowner is supposed to share in that right. But a lot of people want to have a right to sort of have a private bank account in that groundwater bank, in that groundwater, and say, I did the work of putting this water in the ground, that should be mine, that should remain mine for 10 years, 100 years. And California law generally does not allow people to hoard water because it's had this sort of use it or lose it um, aspect of water rights since we started the, the state. Because of that worry that someone was going to lock up the water and then was going to increase the price and then be able to use that power to um, manipulate the market. And we've seen market manipulation in other utilities in California once or twice. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a real tension between this kind of trying to create incentives for people to do groundwater recharge, um, at the same time making sure that communities, particularly the low income communities that don't have that ability to deepen the well, have access to the water when they need it. And we haven't yet, I think to my mind, figured out how to strike that right balance between the incentives and the protections. Great. Yeah, go ahead. Um, great conversation. I, I'm such a pessimist. It's like what I do for a living to be a pessimist, so I'm here for it. Um, I just wanted to touch on SIGMA, um, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, really quick before we go. Um, and the way that that law fails um, families that have are living on domestic wells. Um, the Sigma, to those who don't know it, um, the shortest way I can describe it is in 20 years or so, the agencies that are responsible now for governing groundwater have to theoretically manage it in such a way that the amount coming in is similar to the amount going out, okay? But that doesn't have to take effect for 20 years. Well, now it's less, but something around there. 
Um, and they have to come up with these plans in order to do that. And what we've seen is in, in my area, at least, you know, all of these plans are written by agricultural and political interests, no seat at the table for domestic well users. And they literally consider wells going dry across the region as collateral damage. And that's just fine. Um, and there are conversations about things like, you know, paying families out for the fact that their wells have gone dry and things of that nature. But, you know, at the end of the day, they're just deciding that families who can only afford to have a well of less than 200 feet, like, too bad. You know, the way that we're going to manage this is such that at 500 feet, 1,000 feet, like maybe we can keep it at that kind of balance so that we don't completely drain the aquifer. But it it just isn't, and it's not being implemented fast enough. You know, there's nothing that it can do for the folks that I'm working with whose, you know, wells were dry yesterday. So, you know, it, there was, you know, it, it could be okay, it could be good, you know, it, and it is good to regulate groundwater, but that particular law is just not the right one to use to protect people who need help right now. Been great. Unfortunately, we're a few minutes after one, so we're going to have to leave the questions in the formal panel at that point. But before we adjourn for refreshments and the opportunity also to ask questions and engage in conversation with our panelists, and before I thank our panelists, I want to make one final announcement. Our next Speaking of Water event will be on April 21st at noon. This event will be a virtual event over Zoom. Uh, Andrew Welton, who's a professor of civil engineering at Purdue University, will be giving a talk on the rail spill in East Palestine, Ohio, and its effects on water quality. Very timely issue, so we encourage all of you to join us. Again, we're going to uh, adjourn into the uh, foyer in just a moment, but before I do, I want to greatly thank and ask all of you to please thank Mariah Thompson, Doug Obagi, Elizabeth Salamone, Dave Owen, and Eric Ekdahl for wonderful presentations. Thank you all.